Hey guys, welcome back. We are going to go through the next section of the study guide, which is uh, going to be micro econ. Uh, I did check and everything is working properly, so we're just going to dive right in. So uh, for those of you who are following along at home, this is uh, section two in your study guide. Okay, so microeconomics. Uh, we're talking. We're going to talk about markets first. Um, and I'm not going to talk about all of these markets except for the first one because there is a period later on where we talk about uh, imperfect competition, which is numbers two, three, and four are all imperfect competitions. But what we're going to talk about first is perfectly competitive markets because um, like a lot of things in economics, we um, tend to simplify for some of our uh, illustrations. And when we're talking about supply and demand, uh, equilibrium, elasticity, government controls, all these things, we're going to be using a perfectly competitive market as a as an example and markets are just the number of buyers and sellers and the products that are um, that are offered and so when we're talking about most of the stuff we're going to be considering a perfectly competitive market uh, which means that there are lots of buyers and sellers and products are highly standardized in fact the idea is that the products can't even be dis uh, separated out from one another. So a lot of times people talk about agriculture when they're talking about a perfectly competitive market because things like milk. If you are a dairy farmer and you are selling your milk, there are, at least in Wisconsin, thousands and thousands of other sellers. There are many, many people buying if we consider the end user being, you know, the, the supermarket shopper. Uh, and you, if, once your milk is purchased, it's you can't tell which milk came from Milsna Dairy versus Ukuch dairy versus anybody else. It's all it's all the same milk. And so that's what we're talking about, a perfectly competitive market. Everything, all products are standardized and the same. There are many buyers, many sellers. And in most cases, the seller does not determine the price. Okay? And that, that's kind of important. When we talk about things like monopoly, oligopoly, and mon monopolistic competition, oftentimes the seller has more influence over the price. So... Uh, that's what we're talking about there. Gasoline is another example. There are many buyers and sellers. So the gasoline, even though some stores try to differentiate the gasoline that you buy at Quick Trip is, you know, if you poured it into a, or if you took a gallon of gasoline from Quick Trip and a gallon from BP, you probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference. All right. So that's what we're going to say about markets. There, the other kinds of mon markets are monopolies, oligopolies, and monopolistic competitions. We'll we'll talk more about them later. Okay. Demand. So demand. The quant is when we're talking about demand, we're talking about the quantity that buyers are demanding of a good at a given price. Okay, so on if you notice on the uh, left hand side here, we have um, the price. Okay, and the quantity is always on the bottom when we're do doing a demand or supply graph. That's always going to be the same. One way to remember this is mind your P's and Q's. So P's are always over Q's, price over quantity. So price of the good, quantity demanded. All right. So this is the relationship between the price of a good and the quantity that buyers are demanding at that given price. So, for instance, at price A, and we can go over to the line, go straight down, and that's the quantity demanded. Price B, quantity demanded. So there's always going to be a line sloping down from the left to right. Because at high prices, people demand less of something. Um, so, for instance, let's talk about a bottle of soda. If I go to Quick Trip, and there are there's a whole uh, bunch of sodas, right? If th those sodas are very expensive, say it's two or three dollars a bottle, I'm very I'm not going to demand many of them because I have limited income. But if say Quick Trip were to put a sale on, and all of a sudden the price drops to one dollar, I might demand many sodas because my limited income can get me more soda. So the general rule of thumb is: the higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded. The lower the price, the higher the quantity demanded. So the cheaper something is, the more people want it. The more expensive something is, the less people want it. Um, this negative relationship is called the law of demand. So that's one of those bold terms that you should probably know, law of demand. Uh, so the, the graph that we have here is called a uh, demand schedule. Okay. If you look on page 12 in your book, they have an example of gasoline uh, demand curves for Nora, Steve, and a market. Right, so they kind of give you some ideas there, um, and a lot of times the this demand curve might be different for different people because for a given good at a given price, everybody has different resources. So my demand curve would not look like anybody else's demand curve. When we're talking about micro econ, remember we're talking about um, we're, we're narrowing in one person, one market, one 
firm, that, that sort of thing. Okay. Uh, shifts in the demand curve. So this line, as we can see here over on the, the right, can move, the, the demand curve can move. This has a supply graph on it also. Um, but this, the demand curve can move, and what, that, what I mean by that is the amount of demand at any given price can change based on some factors, okay? So income, if my income goes up, if, this, if the district of Hillsborough suddenly gives me a raise, I can demand more of a given product at any price. So if I'm suddenly making $10,000 more a year, I have a lot more money that I can allocate towards buying soda. So while that relationship is still the same, while I still um, will demand less soda at a higher price and more soda at a low price, my overall demand can shift uh, one way or another. So if the curve shifts to the right, it means that you are demanding more at any price, because if we look at this, the price stays constant. So at um, if we kind of use the, the initial curve here of D and then D1, say this is Hillsborough giving me a raise, it would shift it to the right. Um, so right here would be my initial quantity, right? So we'd be right about here. If a suddenly I get a raise, my demand curve shifts to the right and I can now demand more at that same price. Okay, so the curve moved to the right, now I can demand it right here. So a raise in income would shift it to the right, a decrease in income would shift it to the left. Okay, prices of related goods, continuing on with soda as our example, uh, if, for instance, I go to Quick Trip and I love Baja Blast, I think you guys all know that about me, um, but if I go to Quick Trip and all of a sudden there is Baja Blast is usually $1.99. Let's say that Mellow Yellow is on sale for $0.99 cents a bottle. Okay, That's going to shift my demand curve because a related good is now, uh, the a change in price in a related good is making my demand of Baja Blast less. Um, and there are ki a couple kinds of related goods. Um, so goods for which... Uh, not all goods are normal goods. Goods for which quantity demanded falls as income rises are called inferior goods. We're not going to talk about that. So substitutes and complements are the two kinds of goods that are going, prices are going to matter. So with a, uh, a substitute, makes sense, right? We can substitute that. So for Baja Blast, Meliola might be a substitute. If all of a sudden the price of Meliola goes down, that's going to shift my Baja Blast demand curve left because I can now substitute Meliola. So my demand for... Um, for Baja Blast is going to drop. So at any price, my demand will be less if the prices of related goods are dropping. If my, the prices of related goods rise, so now Mellow Yellow is $3 a bottle, my demand for Baja Blast might shift to the right. I might have more demand for Baja Blast at any given price. The same thing happens with vehicles. So if I am a big Chevy fan, but all of a sudden uh, the price of Chevys increase, that might raise my demand for the price of a Toyota. Okay. So for prices of related goods, if it's a substitute, if their substitutes are cheaper, my demand curve goes left. If my substitutes are more expensive, my demand curve goes to the right. And again, you kind of see down here, if the curve goes to the right, it means more demand. Curve goes to the left, it means less demand. There are also complements, uh, so complementary goods. When a lower price for one good causes a demand for another good to increase, that we call those goods complements. So for instance, if the price of brat buns suddenly goes down they have a, a sale on brat buns at quick trip so that would be a complementary good to or sorry the price of brats goes down brat buns would be a complementary good those are goods that go together so when the price of brats drops and brats are on sale my demand for buns is going to go up because i'm buying more brats so my demand curve shifts to the right so substitutes and complements do opposite things when the price goes down so brats go on sale, brat buns, it's going to shift my demand curve to the right. If brats are more expensive, it's going to shift my demand for brat buns to the left. Okay, the overall curve. Expectations. So let's talk about cell phones. You all love your cell phones. Um, if you are expecting a new product, so let's say that the iPhone 13 is announced that might shift the demand for iPhone 12s because if I am uh, thinking about buying an iPhone 12, right, we've got my normal demand curve, but all of a sudden I know that in a month the iPhone 13 is going to come out, my, my overall demand is going to go down. So my demand at any price for an iPhone 12 is going to go down if I know that there's a new one coming out. So expectations, you kind of just have to be 
um, kind of you have to think through this one. There's no real rule of thumb, but so using the same example, if I hear that the iPhone 13 launch is delayed, it might increase my iPhone 12 demand at any given price. Okay. Numbers of buyers. Market demand is derived by adding up the demand of individual consumers. If there are more consumers, the de then demand will increase. So let's uh, kind of use a classroom as an example. Say that I am selling uh, get out of an assignment free cards in class. And there are 10 people in class and I'm going to sell three, uh, three of those get out of an assignment free cards. Then about one third of the class can afford or can can get one, right? So the demand will be at a, a, a certain level, okay? If suddenly there are 30 people in class, then only one in 10 people are going to get them and the demand will increase. So more buyers, demand curve shifts to the right. Less buyers, demand curve shifts to the left because there are less buyers to demand, okay? That should make sense. So more buyers to the right, less buyers to the left. Okay, and that pretty much wraps up demand. Now we're going to start talking about supply, which is the opposite side of that. So supply curve, much like er, is kind of the opposite of demand. The relationship between the price of a good and the quantity that sellers will supply at that price. Now same thing, we mind our P's and Q's, so price is on the left hand, the vertical column, uh, quantity is on the, uh, the X axis, the, the horizontal. And as price increases, supply increases. So where we had a negative relationship with demand, we have a positive relationship with supply, which kind of makes sense. If I'm a company producing something, the more I can sell it for, the more I want to supply, right? If I can sell Mountain Dew at $2 a bottle or $4 a bottle, which one am I going to be more excited about? $4 a bottle. Okay, this positive relationship is between price and quantity is the law of supply. Make, should make sense. Um, and again, we have a supply curve, just like uh, demand. So a lot like demand, there are things that can shift a supply curve. So we'll dump, jump right in here. Uh, input prices. So um, if I am a company building iPhones, we're gonna stick with iPhones as an example. If the cost of my inputs goes up, it's going to raise the overall cost of my good. And so my supply curve will shift to the left, okay? So a shift to the left is less supply at any price, a shift to the right is more supply at any price. Because at any given price, my income is going to be reduced if my input prices are higher. So input prices going up shifts the curve to the left. Input prices going down, so now say I find some new fancy components that are cheaper, I can supply more iPhones at any given price because my income will be higher because my costs are lower. Technology does a similar thing. Changes in technology can affect how businesses operate and the quantity supplied. In the case of gasoline, a shift from full service to self-service reduces labor costs, costs and increases the quantity supplied. Um, think of this like Walmart, right? So we all know that at Walmart, there over the past five to 10 years, there are less and less uh, checkout counters available and there are more and more self-checkout counters. That technology of being able to have people self-check out can increase the supply at any given price for Walmart, right? Because technology is reducing uh, some of their burden, in this case labor, they're able to supply more at any given price because their costs are reduced, okay? Um, that's pretty much improving, improving technology generally shifts the curve to the right. There's very rarely a decrease in technology um, that would shift it to the left, almost always technology is going to shift you to the right, where you have more supply at any given price. Expectations. Um, this is one that it's, we're going to talk about gasoline, because I, I feel like that's always one that expectations change things. So if all of a sudden uh, the, uh, there is expected to be some unrest in the Middle East where a lot of oil supply comes from, that's going to change the supply and price relationship. So um, if there's an expectation that some, for some reason oil shipments from the Middle East might be disrupted, that's going to shift that to the left because at any given price, uh, suppliers are going to supply less because in this instance they are afraid that they might not have that supply. Okay, so, uh, or there's an expectation that uh, there's a new technology to get more oil from, say, North Dakota. That might shift the curve to the right because there's an expectation that the supply of oil will increase and at any given price they can supply more. Okay, so that's kind of an example. Again, with expectations, you kind of just have to logically think through that. 
There's no rule for supply curve shifting expectations. Number of buyers. Uh, I should say sellers. Number of sellers. Um, demanding was buyers. Supplying is going to be sellers. Um, as more sellers enter the market, the quantity supplied will increase. On the other hand, if a seller decides to leave the market, the quantity supplied will be reduced. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so that's supply and demand. Now we're going to talk about putting those two together and finding equilibrium. And this uh, graph here should be kind of an idea of what equilibrium looks like. The natural point at which the supply and demand curves intersect. Now, what that m the reason for that is um, this is the point at which the quantity supplied and quantity demand and price are all the same. Okay, So the price at which the quantity supplied and demanded match. And that means that all, all of the supply will meet all of the demand. Um, if the price is, for some reason, above the equilibrium point, it means that demand will be lower because the quantity demanded is down here than supply. Because there, if it's a high price, suppliers are going to want to supply a lot, but demanders are not going to want to buy a lot. If the price is lower than equilibrium, so say down here, the demand will be high. It's going to be way over here. But the supply is going to be way over here, so there's going to be a shortage. All right? So what the idea is that markets will naturally find this equilibrium point where the supply and the demand and the price all match up. Um, and that's called equilibrium. Kind of think of that word equal. So let's jump into shifts in equilibrium. I do have a cheat sheet that I will uh, post on Classroom for this uh, as kind of a how to tell where your equilibrium point is going to go. And I'll make a separate video on using that cheat sheet. But just briefly kind of talking about shifts in the equilibrium. As either, as either curve shifts, so does the equilibrium. So if my supply curve shifts to the right, uh, say my technology uh, is going to increase, right? As my supply curve shifts to the right, so will my equilibrium point because the intersection point is going to move. Um, so things, and if, if the, I'm going to lose my spot here. Um, but sometimes we might have um, prices that are set at different spots. And the way that I'm going to explain this is Kohl's. So if you've ever seen a full price piece of clothing at Kohl's, I think you're a liar. Um, but if you notice that uh, at Kohl's there's always um, discount racks and things like that. So what happens is Kohl's is going to set their price for um, a new shirt. Let's say golf polos, because I, I shop for those frequently. Say they set a golf polo out at $40 a shirt, which is not an unusual price for a new golf polo. Well, let's say that that's this point right here, okay? There's going to be a lot of uh, clothing manufacturers who would love to sell a golf polo at $40, or Kohl's might want to sell a lot of those at $40, okay? However, buyers might not be might not think that that is worth that much. So the demand is going to be rather low. So the supply is going to exceed the demand at, say this is $40 for a shirt. So eventually Kohl's is going to uh, clearance that shirt. And they're going to put it down to $10 on the clearance rack. Well now, there's a lot of people who want a $10 golf polo, but Kohl's doesn't really want to sell that many. So the demand might exceed the supply. So eventually what's going to happen is this price will probably yo-yo for a little while until it meets in the middle here at $20, okay, or $25 in this case. And sometimes there are price floors and price ceilings. I don't know if I have an example of that. I think we talk, we'll talk about price controls later when we talk about government controls. But as, the, as either curve shifts, the equilibrium shifts. So again, say that uh, I get a raise, my demand curve will shift to the right, and this equilibrium point will actually raise in price because I can demand more even though the supply curve does not change. And again, I will talk about, I'll make a separate video for my little uh, equilibrium cheat sheet. But going back, uh, it is important to understand how those curves shift to understand equilibrium because um, both of those curves can actually shift and we ha you have to be able to kind of determine the equilibrium point. Okay. So now we're going to talk about elasticity. Okay. So elasticity is the slope of the demand or supply curve. Okay, that's kind of the, the easy way that I explain it. 
what it if we want to get technical about it it's how sensitive the quantity supplied or demanded is to the compared to the price so let's just jump into demand elasticity um, this is a, an example from your book and so this is on page uh, 28 uh, figure 13 I believe so in this case this is a perfectly inelastic um, example. So a 22% increase in price has no change in quantity demanded. Um, inelastic goods mean that no matter how much the price changes, the quantity demanded is always going to be roughly the same. Um, inelastic means that there, the curve is rather steep, but it is not perfectly vertical. Elastic means that the slope is roughly equal to 1. And elasticity greater than 1 means the slope is uh, rather flat. Um, so, inelastic goods do not, the demand does not change much with price. So if it's inelastic, it does not change much with price. If it's elastic, it means that the, the quantity demanded does increase greatly with price. And so some examples of this, um, an elastic good might be something like, uh, these are luxury goods usually, so, um, or prices uh, of cars. Um, and usually elastic goods have a lot of um, substitutes and inelastic goods do not, um, but that's neither here nor there. And if it's perfectly inelastic, it means that there's only one price that anybody will demand anything at. But there are very few products that are that. All right, elastic, uh, inelastic products are usually things like gasoline. So pretty much no matter what people have to drive. So um, no matter what the cost is, the demand of gas is going to stay relatively flat or relatively the same. Or food products are oftentimes, um, or food as a general thing is inelastic. But if you look at certain food products like high-end luxury foods like caviar, right, that might have a much more elastic uh, supply curve or demand curve. So again, inelastic means that the quantity demanded does not change much. Elastic means it does change a lot with price. Okay, supply elasticity is the opposite. All right, if something is perfectly inelastic, it means that the supply will be the same at any given price. Usually, this is public goods, so things like roads. Right, no matter what the cost of a road is, the government is going to supply roughly the same amount. We'll talk about types of goods as we go in here. Inelastic means that the supply does not change much with a change in price. Uh, and as we go up, right, uh, elastic means that the quantity supplied does change significantly with price. Um, another supply, another inelastic good might be farm goods, right? You have to milk your cows, so no matter what the price is, you're going to milk your cows the same. You're not going to like get rid of your cow, uh, get rid of a, some of your milk and pour it on the ground just because the price goes down. So um, agricultural products are good examples of inelastic supplies, where no matter what you're you're probably going to supply the same quantity, whereas other goods are more generally um, elast high, have higher elasticity, and then again, perfectly inelastic supplies. So, m again, much the same, just kind of in the opposite direction. All right, government controls. The government can add in price controls or taxes, which have an effect on supply and demand in a market. So, for example, price in floor ceilings. Uh, and this happens a lot with agricultural goods and rent. Those are kind of the two um, traditional ones. So if you add in, oh, I'm going to back up, a price floor, it means that the price cannot drop below that. And that happens a lot with um, farm products. So it's a way to protect farmers. The price can't go, low, go below $1 a gallon of milk. I don't really know what the price floor is. But that means that the price can no longer f fall below that. Uh, and this generally creates a surplus on the supply side because the price is going to be artificially high. A price ceiling means that a price cannot go above that, and that generally creates a demand surplus. So supply surplus for price floors, demand surplus for price ceilings. So for instance, this is um, minimum wage. So this is another way to, to look at um, price floors. So the 
uh, this is if we're thinking about labor as a good. If the minimum wage is five dollars, that means that there are uh, the supply or the demand. I don't like this example. Uh, we're going to talk about rent. Say that rent is five dollars. No, nope, I got to think about this backwards. Hold on. There we go. Let's talk about milk. Let's say that milk is five cents per gallon. Okay. And it can't go below that. That means that the people who are the dairies who are demanding the milk are have a have their demand set at a certain point. Um, and as we know that as prices go up, right, they demand uh, they demand less. However, suppliers uh, are going to demand a certain point of, the, uh, of this as well. So. I am confused, confusing myself. So the supply of milk is going to be at a certain point and demand is going to be at a certain point. So this is actually confusing me. We're going to move on. Price ceiling, mean that prices can't go above this. So $400, this is rent. So this is for a price ceiling. Um, so it means that supply is going to be low, but the demand is going to be high because the price is artificially low. Whereas in this case, with the price floor, the, de the demand is uh, less than the supply. Okay, because, yeah, there we go. So the, the farmers are supplying more milk at $5 or $0.05 cents than the dairies are demanding. So this is going to produce a supply-side surplus. Whereas in this case, with the rent ceiling, the price being artificially low creates a demand-side surplus. Okay, taxes have a similar effect. Taxes are often shared between a supplier and buyer. So if you think of gas, all right? So the, gov the government gases or taxes each gallon of gas, and so then the gas stations generally tack that onto the price that they charge for gas. Um, so a tax on a good is likely to make suppliers supply less and buyers demand less due to the artificial increase in price. Okay, so it's just generally going to create um, a going to kind of move the equilibrium point where it depresses the market altogether. Trade. No economy exists in a vacuum. Um, and most often, each econ every economy or every market has a um, something it's good at. And looking at trade-offs, or the so then if we trade, we can do better things. And looking at po production possibility frontiers, or PPS, uh, is one way of doing that. And so we're on page 39 at the moment. Okay, so we're on figure 20. Um, so Robinson and Crusoe each can produce coconuts or fish, or some combination thereof. So this is their production possibility frontier. So they can produce up to, if I zoom in here, uh, so Crusoe can produce up to 36 fish or coconuts and zero fish, or 36 fish and zero coconuts, or some combination thereof, where it's like 18 and 18, right? Robinson, on the other hand, can produce 24 coconuts and zero fish, or 8 fish and zero coconuts, or some combination thereof. Uh, the trade-offs for each one to produce either coconuts or fish is different, right? So Crusoe has a one-to-one -one trade-off, whereas uh, Robinson, for every extra fish they produce, they're giving up three coconuts. Whereas Crusoe, again, for every extra fish they produce, they give up one coconut. So... The idea here is that each should specialize in the one product that they are compared. It's comparatively less costly to do. So if you do the math in this one, and we're not going to spend a ton of time doing the math, um, it ends up being that um, they uh, points out that the moment they're producing a total of 33 coconuts, if we use the points on the map. But if Robinson were to devote eight hours to gathering coconuts, he, coconuts, he could produce 24 coconuts. So if he spends all of his day making coconuts. However, if Crusoe spent only two more hours fishing, so she produces slightly more fish, one-fourth more fish, uh, she could produce nine coconuts and 27 fish. Together, their combined production would be 33 coconuts, the same as before, and 27 fish, six more than before. If they split this extra production, they could each increase their consumption by three fish. So by... Robinson specializing in um, producing coconuts and Crusoe still producing some coconuts but producing more fish they're actually able to both be better off even though at any point 
Caruso's production is higher in all and Robinson's production is lower in all because they have comparative advantages in certain things, they can both be better off. Okay. Types of profit. Economic profits. So economic profits include the opportunity cost of all resources required for production plus the actual um, profit that you make. So you would take your total profit minus your opportunity cost to find out your economic profit. Whereas accounting profits are simply the total of revenue minus production costs. So it's, we tend, when we think of how much profit did you make, we tend to think of accounting profits. Economic profits add in the opportunity cost to the total uh, stand piece there. This shouldn't change shifts in equi equilibrium. It should say firm supply curves. So one thing we need to talk about when we're talking about supply curves is fixed versus variable costs. So fixed costs do not change with production. Uh, things like rent, property, cost of machinery. And so the actual su um, supply curve is generally going to look a little bit curvy rather than a straight line when we kind of simplify it. Variable costs change with production. Cost of supplies, labor, electricity. And um, the marginal cost is the cost of each successive item produced. So this is kind of an idea of um, your revenue, what you charge for something at a given price is always the same. But your cost for your number of things you produce is going to be different. And we'll look at that here in a second. So, in this circumstance, i got to remember what the, uh, so this is Bob's Bread Company. Uh, we're on page 44 here. Uh, so for every loaf of bread produced, er, we have fixed costs of $250, right? His rent and utilities, basically, are going to be $250. However, his variable costs go up, and that's going to be the cost of labor, the cost of um, packaging, the cost of supplying the actual stuff to make the bread. And so his total cost goes up. And it, you'll notice that the change in total cost continues to go up higher and higher and higher as he goes on. Because as you add more and more things, you become, or more and more um, production, you become less efficient. So for example, without getting a new shop, Bob can only add so many people into uh, the scenario before they start to trip over each other and become less efficient. Or he's going to run out of oven space unless he can buy a new oven, so he's going to back up his um, the timeliness that he can produce things. So when we look at this, his marginal revenue, he's always charging $4 a loaf, no matter what. So his marginal cost is going to change as he goes up. So and the marginal cost just means the cost of every next item. And so we look at his marginal cost continues to raise until it hits $4. And what we find out then is his total revenue reaches $1,200. And total revenue continues to raise, but the costs raise faster and faster to the point at which the costs eventually begin to overtake the total revenue, which we don't necessarily think is being true. But if we go back here, marginal revenue, marginal cost. Okay, costs initially drop, um, marginal cost initially drops and then continues to go up. Okay, so eventually uh, there's a per point at which he, producing 300 bread, he is making $50 of profit um, because his total revenue has increased to such a point uh, and his costs have not in, have not overtaken his uh, revenue to the point where he's making the most money. If he were to make 450 loaves of bread, he would take in the maximum amount of money, but he would act, his costs would be such that it would actually lose him money. So that's marginal cost. Types of imperfect competition. Monopolies, there's only one supplier with many buyers. I'm not going to jump into these two a lot, um, just because... Um, there's not gonna, probably going to be as much on there. Oligopoly, small number of suppliers. Um, think car manufacturers. There's only like five major car manufacturers in the United States. Um, cartels are a big thing. So OPEC, the oil producing and exporting countries, which the United States is not a part of, uh, they control the oil prices. And so some cartels, uh, when they talk about a cartel, we're not think ca talking about drug cartels. We're talking about groups of people who get together, or groups of firms who get together and set prices. Um, often have similar products but they are differentiated products, so you can tell the different uh, Chevy from a Ford to, to a Toyota, but there are still very few suppliers. Monopolistic competition um, is aspects of monopoly and perfect competition. So um, they have differentiated products, so you can tell a Big Mac from a Whopper from a Butterburger, but it's all still pretty similar, and there are still high numbers of uh, buyers and sellers. Market failures. 
uh, externalities are unintended consequences of a third uh, on a third party of an economic transaction. So pollution is kind of the big one. So I have a factory to uh, produce cars, and it's putting out pollution, which ends up affecting uh, a farm down the street because it's killing off their crops. That's a unintended consequence of a third party, or on a third party. That's an example of a negative, um, a negative externality. There are positive externalities. Say the price of college educations goes down, um, then that might have an overall positive effect on the economy. And uh, so it's a market failure where something that the market doesn't account for um, and happens as a result. Public goods when private property rights cannot be established. So externalities, government, reg uh, government regulation, pollution. Um, government often has to step in to regulate externalities for things like pollution, right? We have the EPA. Um, some externalities can have private responses that aren't the government. So say that I don't mow my lawn and I don't keep up my house and it ends up driving um, the property values around me down. The negative externality there is that the property value of my neighbor is going down because I am making the rational choice to not invest in my house. So a private response to that might be uh, everybody in the neighborhood getting together and creating a homeowners association to enforce uh, upkeep. Uh, the same thing happens for the government regulations. It's just from a government perspective, and there's usually a penalty involved with that. Public goods. Uh, there are four types of public goods. Or there are four types of goods: private, collective, common, and public. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the tragedy of the commons because this video is already super long. <clears throat> and so the way that we tell uh, goods apart is rivalry of consumption and excludability. So in rivalry of consumption, does my consumption reduce the total number available? So, for instance, if I eat a Snickers bar, there's one less Snickers bar for everybody else to eat. That means that Snickers bars are rival goods. If I drive on a road, it does not prevent you from driving on the road also, to a certain extent. Um, and then excludability. Can others be kept from enjoying it? If I eat a Snickers bar, then you can't enjoy that Snickers bar. However, if I listen to the radio station, you can still listen to the radio station, and it, my listening to it doesn't affect you. So that would mean that Snickers bars are both rival and excludable. However, the radio, my consumption doesn't reduce the total number of radio song or the radio available for other people to listen to, nor can I exclude you from listening to it. So that would mean that the radio is neither, regular radio, is neither rival nor excludable. And so the combination of rivalry and excludability tells us what type of good it is. And this is figure 29 from somewhere in your textbook. I don't remember exactly what page. Um, but uh, if things are highly excludable and highly rival, it means that they are private. Things like pizza, haircuts, gasoline, Snickers bars. If, if goods cannot be excludable, or nor are they rival, they tend to be public goods, like I said, radio broadcasts, national defense, tornado sirens. If they are, are excludable, but uh, not... If they are rival, but not excludable, then they are common resources, fish, the environment, city streets, right? Because if we have an that can be excludable. Or if they are uh, not excludable, but they are highly, oh, sorry, if they are highly excludable, but not rival, then they are collected goods, like websites, pay-per-view movies, and satellite radio. And that's it. All right, uh, again, make sure you read your, uh, your notes and make sure that you are following along. I'm not going to do a specific video on the Cold War stuff. So make sure you read that on your own, but hopefully this is a good companion to help you understand some of your study guide notes for economics.